In this segment, we're going to talk about what the BERT model actually looks like and how it gets applied to downstream tasks. So the, there were two versions of the BERT model presented in the original paper. Both are transformer models, so following the architecture that we discussed before. And these are big models. BERT base has 12 layers, and BERT large has 24 layers. Um, each of which has the dimensions listed here. So for BERT large, a thousand dimensional uh, embeddings for each word piece token, 16 attention heads at each layer. Uh, and that gives a total number of parameters of 340 million. So a very large number of parameters compared to the past neural models that we've seen. So the one other aspect of transformers we discussed was the need to represent position in them somehow. Because by default, the self-attention mechanism doesn't, it sort of treats the input as a bag of words. You don't have any notion that these two words occur next to each other, um, which is important for dealing with sentences. And so what they did was they had uh, an additional set of encodings, one set that captured position by basically just embedding an integer index that represents where the word is in the sequence. And then they also had what they called segment embeddings, uh, which we'll come back to in a minute. So this model is the one that they first pre-train on a large corpus using the mass language modeling objective that we talked about before. Then the question is, how do we apply it to other tasks and what can we actually do with that? So one other important thing about BERT is the presence of this CLS token at the beginning, which uh, was used to do the next sentence prediction task that we discussed earlier. This, the basically the vector at the end that you get associated with the CLS token is the vector that you typically use for doing classification in BERT. So what you'll do is you'll put, uh, you'll use BERT as a kind of black box to encode your sentence and produce this single vector associated with the CLS token. And then you take that, you feed it into whatever classification layer or maybe a sort of small feed forward network to do your final prediction for whatever task you're doing. So the nice thing about BERT and one of the big advantages compared to prior work was that it could really do sentence pair tasks a lot better. So what this means is a task like paraphrase detection. Can you tell whether these two sentences are paraphrases of each other? And the way this works is you just kind of ram these sentences together and feed them into BERT and again use this CLS embedding to do classification. Uh, and then finally, BERT can do tagging as well, uh, similar to what we saw for LSTMs. You know, any model that can produce a contextual embedding of each token. You can take that embedding and map it into something like an NER tag here. Okay, so why is it so good at these kind of sentence pair tasks? Well, one reason is that transformers are pretty good at taking sort of seemingly independent chunks of, chunks of the input and using the self-attention mechanism to figure out an alignment between them. And so, they capture interaction between these two sentences. And I'll emphasize that most of this happens during fine tuning, even though there was this next sentence prediction or NSP objective, that's not really all that important for performance. Uh, mostly it's just the fact that uh, when you have two sentences like this, self-attention allows you to really figure out, okay, which parts of each of these sentences is kind of supported by the other one. Uh, and then if we want to predict entailment, for example, does the first sentence imply the second one? That mapping between pieces is something that the model can sort of figure out somewhere in these, uh, you know, 12 layers and however many attention heads there are. All right, so BERT seems great. One thing it cannot do well is generate text. Uh, the only way you can do this is basically populate a whole sequence up to this point, stick a mask token on the end, and then say, okay, fill in this mask token. Uh, the problem is that this ends up being sort of order n squared in the length of what you want to generate, because then as soon as you fill in that mask token, you need to rerun the whole computation with another mask token on the end. Uh, and, you know, you might be able to generate multiple, uh, you know, fillers at a time, but then you don't know whether like this filler and this filler are really going to be coherent once you actually, you know, take the real words there. 
So these models were not intended for text generation. They were intended for these sorts of analysis tasks like uh, sentiment classification and things like that. So that's okay, and, and this is a kind of feature of how they were designed. All right, so the general procedure is that once we have this pre-trained model, we have to do this fine-tuning step of continuing to train it on whatever our actual task is. So uh, the model's pre-trained on the mass language modeling objective, and then when we have our sentiment data, we say, okay, we want the class label and whatever um, matrix of like output uh, basically mapping into the uh, mapping into the actual prediction space for our downstream task, we want to train that matrix now and fine tune the rest of BERT. So the way you do this is you run gradient descent on your new data set, typically for a small number of epochs and also with a very small learning rate. And so kind of graphically, the way we can think about what happens is that, like I said, the, the next sentence prediction loss isn't actually all that impactful for BERT. And so the CLS embedding, one of the main things that the fine tuning process does is it kind of rewires the last step of self-attention here to try to feed the useful information into the CLS token. So the way I'm kind of drawing this is that there's big changes here at the top. We fine tuning, we change the the parameters closer to the output of the network a lot, and then kind of less as we go back through it. That's where the more sort of pre-trained part kicks in. So the, you know, with the with these smaller changes, that means that the weights aren't changing as much. And as a result, we're going to be able to keep the benefits of pre-training and the kind of, you know, general language understanding capabilities, let's say, that's put into this model by the mass language modeling objective. All right, and so the, the you know the 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 way in which you fine tune BERT is is very complex. There's a lot of different schemes for this using various optimizers, kind of weird learning rate tricks like warm up, where you start with a very small learning rate, you increase it and then you decrease it again, uh, and you know sometimes you do that multiple times. So there's a lot of sort of black magic here. Most of the libraries that implement this stuff will uh, kind of walk you through that, I guess. All right, and so this is very different than how we talked about ELMO. So we talked about this. Uh, we talked about this table, which showed that backpropagating into the ELMO parameters was generally not a good idea. Uh, that's shown in the uh, kind of fourth row down here, where we see this delta between the fine-tuned, which is the fire, and the frozen ELMO embeddings, which is the ice. Uh, is negative, meaning that fine tuning actually hurts Elmo. But this is flipped around for BERT. So BERT, you almost you you rarely want to use it as a source of pre-trained embeddings. You almost always want to fine tune that as your network for whatever task you're doing. So like I said, that's a big difference in paradigm. And uh, most approaches these days follow the BERT paradigm where uh, both fine tuning is encouraged and also, of course, works better. All right, so they evaluated it across this range of tasks, um, a slightly more formal benchmark than the, just the collection of tasks in Elmo, um, and this benchmark was called GLUE. And it captures uh, a range of different types of uh, mostly sort of semantic inference tasks um, with either single sentence input or a pair of sentences as input. And most of the outputs are categorical and you know it sort of classification tasks like are these things paraphrases or not etc so the impressive thing about this was just how well it worked so uh, the pre open AI uh, soda at the top this is basically the kind of best systems that people had put together with neural models for each task independently and so this reflected in some cases like for example SST2, years of work on this particular data set and many research papers optimizing architectures for that particular you know, sentiment classification task. And then you can see that uh, uh, Elmo and GPT kind of were doing on 
par with this stuff. And that was impressive given that they were able to do it with a uniform architecture. But then BERT, especially BERT Large, just blew these things out of the water. Um, the gains on this are, are really quite substantial. And uh, again, a lot of that comes from dealing with better with these sentence pair tasks. So in terms of what BERT is doing, it's very hard to say. And I mean, we'll get some functional understanding of how BERT works going forward. Um, but there was some work uh, due to Clark et al, which looked at visualizing some of what's going on inside the attention heads. And so there's, there's some interesting different behaviors, behaviors you get. Some of the heads, like the second one we're seeing here, attend locally. Like, for example, they look at the next or the previous word uh, to inform a word about its context. Um, there's also a sort of weird interplay between some of the placeholder tokens like SEP or you know, tokens that normally don't mean a whole lot, like periods to end sentences, um, typically not that useful for text classification problems. Uh, there's a weird sort of interaction where these tokens sometimes attend very broadly, and maybe the model is using these to kind of store information about an entire sentence in one place. The other analysis they looked at, which is pretty informative, was tying this to notions of dependency parsing like we established earlier. So for example, one thing you might expect is that if you have a word, it should attend to things that are syntactically relevant for it. And in the dependency formalism, we were able to directly say, OK, this word is either a parent or a child of this other word. And what they found was that uh, there, was, there were some heads that could do things like for uh, verbs, pick out their direct objects, or for nouns, pick out their modifiers. And you know, the, 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 the results from this aren't like better than supervised parsers by any stretch of the imagination, but this is learned in a totally unsupervised way internal to the model. So it's very cool to see it discovering these useful notions of syntax for what it's doing. So the final thing I'll say about BERT is that there are now better variants. I mean, BERT is still relatively commonly used, but probably one of the most common replacements is called Roberta for robustly optimized BERT. Um, largely, the improvements are not conceptually very, uh, you know, it's not conceptually different from what we've looked at before. They have about 10 times the amount of data. Rather than masking the same words in each sentence as you do multiple passes through the data, they mask different words, um, which is you know something that just kind of makes sense. Um, and uh, another another thing which which helps these models is whole word masking. So rather, if you have a word that's multiple word pieces, rather than masking just one word piece and leaving the others, instead mask out all the word pieces. Um, so that's an improvement that's even been pushed into the original BERT at this point. Um, and so there's libraries that allow you to access all this stuff. Um, Hugging Face is a company that maintains a fairly well-known transformers library with all of the pre-trained models and a bunch more contributed by the community. Um, and FairSeq, uh, maintained by Facebook, also has uh, some of this stuff, uh, in particular Roberta. So there's plenty of libraries for that, that help you use these things and, and kind of give you access to the latest and greatest in terms of pre-trained weights here. So generally, what, we, what we've seen is that we can take these different, uh, you know, these architectures like BERT and use them for a wide variety of tasks. And as we go forward in the course, we'll talk about and, and see basically that almost all the best systems are, are now using this stuff. So it's an important ingredient to be aware of and something that you're definitely going to want to consider um, if you're building uh, kind of real applications and care a lot about the performance. That's the end of this segment.